everyone, this is Keisha Rogers and this past week I had the pleasure of attending the Lunar Planetary Institute Conference of planetary scientists from all across the country and across the world coming together to discuss the latest scientific breakthroughs in human space flight and planetary science. I had the pleasure of interviewing Pamela Clark of the Catholic University and Goddard Space Center who was introduced to sciences by none other than Werner von Braun himself at the age of 16 years old. Now, Ms. Clark's unique experience in the space industry really came about, um, as she said, at the age of 10 years old, where she was really fascinated by the space sciences, uh, as well as looking at, in her experience over the years, uh, being able to recognize the shift that had been taking place in uh, the direction that the space community was taking uh, and the cultural downshift that she witnessed even after the assassination of President Kennedy and his brother Bobby Kennedy. Uh, one of the unique things presented uh, in the interview was her understanding of the shift away from a real scientific and technological mission orientation that we witnessed and that the nation witnessed under President Kennedy during the Apollo mission, where you had the scientific community organized around one coherent, cohesive mission. And uh, her and I attended a couple of these Planetary Institute meetings together, and we both agreed, and what she understood is that there was no clear direction, and still remains to be, uh, under the current administration, no clear direction as to what, where we're going as a nation and where humanity is going um, in terms of our mission to explore into space and take up the greatest developments in the scientific and technological progress. So my name is Pamela Clark, and uh, I don't know what to call myself exactly. I guess you could call me a space scientist. I jokingly call myself a rocket scientist because I've been a part of NASA since I was about 10 years old, even when I wasn't working for NASA. And I decided, um, basically, after, when I was really young, after John Kennedy gave the speech about having a real space program, we will go to the moon. We'll go to the moon and do the other things, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. That was pretty exciting, actually, along with all the other exciting things that he said. So, uh, I, um, you know, that that's just, you know, that I was convinced that that's what I wanted to do with my life, even though no one else really took it seriously. When I was uh, in high school, I was selected to be part of a space exploration conference sponsored by Girl Scouts was at Marshall Space Flight Center. We were supposed to meet Werner von Braun the first day we were there. And he couldn't make it, so we sent his deputy, so all 50 of us sent him letters. And we said we were really glad to be there, but we were a little disappointed. We didn't get to meet him. So when he came back from wherever he was, he came to meet us where we were staying. So we had a nice informal visit with him. And, you know, I feel kind of at that point that the torch was passed. So... I, um, when I was in college, I went to a small liberal arts college for women, and I majored in chemistry. And uh, I worked for somebody who, my undergraduate advisor, had helped to develop criteria for biogenicity for moon rocks. And then I went out, when I went on to graduate school, I ended up working for someone who was a pioneer in orbital geochemistry. He and other people on my committee in graduate school had developed the first, uh, developed the first gamma ray and X-ray spectrometers that were pointed down to the surface to take elemental abundance data of the surface, provide direct compositional information. No one had ever done that before, and frankly, based on the stories he told me, that you know, despite the calculations that they did, they were not really sure until they got the actual data that, that was really going to happen. Um, so by default, I kind of became a remote sensing scientist and I worked with that data. And it was part of the first effort to develop a planetary database for the lunar data, lunar consortium data, it was called. And uh, we basically put it all into a common 
format so that we could compare all these different data sets from orbital observations taken from the Apollo service module, um, ground-based observations of the moon, and uh, try to figure out what it all meant from a geological standpoint. Um, that was the first part of my career, and since then, I've looked at other planets from the same kind of data, I've looked at asteroids, Mercury, and um, I got involved with developing instruments, um, missions, um, actually doing some systems engineering more recently in my career. And one of the things that I do well is I, I see the big picture, I connect the dots, so I'm interested in figuring out how one kind of data relates to another kind of data that's completely different. Or I look at planetary uh, planets as systems with interior, interior surfaces, atmospheres, uh, potentially magnetospheres. And so that's kind of what drew me to being interested in Mercury, especially when people said it was like the moon, which of course Mercury is nothing like the moon. Um, and I wrote a book on Mercury as a system. It's called Dynamic Planet. So if we look at the interaction between the interior, and we know that Mercury has a magnetic field. And uh, because it has a magnetic field like the Earth, that means it must have a portion, partially molten core, which, based on what we understood about Mercury, is very difficult to explain, except that we knew Mercury is very dense, which implies it has a lot of iron, which you'd expect in an iron-rich core, which could generate a magnetic dynamo and therefore a magnetic field. Um, and um, the implication when we looked closely at Mercury was that uh, it actually had a lot of volcanic activity, implying a very active planet. Um, when Mercury, the Mariner 10 mission flew by Mercury three times from about 1973 to 1974, um, there wasn't a lot of time spent on reducing the data because they were getting ready to do the Viking mission to Mars. So for a long time, people just looked at the data superficially and said, well, it's kind of like the moon, it's got a lot of craters, it doesn't have an atmosphere, and I kind of put it on the shelf. So one of the things I was interested in doing when I did my graduate work, I did a postdoc at JPL, was to uh, take another look at Mercury and uh, you know, really to look at it from the standpoint of how unlike the moon it really was. And Mercury actually has a, uh, apparently, based on recent observations from messengers, it's been active until relatively recently, been completely resurfaced uh, volcanically. Um, it has an exosphere, which means it has a very tenuous atmosphere which interacts with the surface. And it has a magnetosphere, because like the Earth, it has a magnetic field which traps charged particles. And so we also have the magnetosphere interacting with the solar wind. The sun is very close to Mercury. And, uh, and, the, and plasma. And sometimes the uh, interaction is so intense that the, uh, magnetos the magnetosphere itself actually touches the surface of Mercury. So it's an extremely dynamic planet. As dynamic as the Earth is in terms of interactions between the magnetosphere and the atmosphere, Mercury, the speed at which things happen on Mercury, is probably an order of magnitude greater. Um, and it's, so it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating place. I wrote a book about it. I talked about the, I called it Dynamic Planet. I talk about the interactions between the different systems on Mercury. Most of the work on Mercury until then had really focused on either studying the magnetic field magnetosphere, people who are fields and particles physicists, or studying the uh, surface based on observations that were made by Mariner 10, images that were taken by Mariner 10. And there really had been very little, uh, very little work doing, sort of connecting everything. Uh, that's the work I did on Mercury, which you asked me about before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what do you see as the need for uh, the continuation of this work, particular for a future mission orientation. Yeah, I'm very concerned that uh, we have a real space program. Um, I think it's something that's very much in line with our our our, our destiny as a nation and our our myths about ourselves. Myth in a very positive sense, how we tell our own story, how it fits in with the. Uh, basically the need for frontier and the pioneering movement in this country. And I also believe strongly that 
um, having a maintaining a, a uh, strategic lead in aerospace is uh, crucial for survival in the 21st century and beyond. So um, it's been disheartening to see what happened since the dismantling of the Apollo program at the height of its success. Um, for the last 30 or 40 years, we've essentially lived with a continually shrinking pie, and the paradigm has been to take that whatever we're offered essentially by Washington and divide it um, among the uh, most powerful factions at NASA. And uh, we made some effort during the Constellation program to uh, think about a return to the moon. But unfortunately, the mandate was made without really the proper underpinnings. Flying uh, an Apollo-style mission 40 years later, when we've eroded our industrial base quite considerably, is quite a challenge. And many of the processes we use to support the Apollo mission, and we can no longer build a lot of the things we built back then. In fact, we've uh, lost some of the expertise we had, the people that actually developed the rocket industry. You have to remember that um, production of the Saturn V was uh, basically just another step in a process that had gone on for decades before with a lot of the rocket engineering that had occurred in Germany, for example, and German scientists we inherited, including Werner von Braun, um, at the end of World War II, played a very critical role in that. Um, so the, um, I feel strongly that um, we should not be, NASA shouldn't be a secondary consideration at all. We shouldn't be willing to, to give it away especially at a time when um, the, par the old paradigms we've been using for so long really have failed. It's a time when we should be considering more investment to have a future. Mm -hmm. So I, th I see a couple of different ways of making this happen. Uh, but one of, one of the most critical pieces actually has to do with support for technology. Uh, I think that without, without investment in breakthroughs in, in technology, then we will not have breakthroughs in science. And if we continue to do the same things that we've been doing with the same kind of technologies, it's actually old technology now. now so I think we'll continue to erode any real any real interest in having a space program. Mm -hmm. So I think that for the first of all, I think it's wise, and there's been some talk about this in Washington, actually investing in a real technology development program that's not tied specifically to the flight projects. It actually, is an ongoing uh, investment and development program that looks at developing core technologies that will enable us to do thing, two things. One is the robotic exploration, and the other is human exploration. And I don't see those as separate, actually. I think we really need both components. It's been greatly detrimental that um, there has been this dichotomy at NASA in some circles, in a sort of thinking that the two are in competition with each other, or that technology is in competition with funding for science. They're extremely complementary. It's really need to have both. Mm -hmm. Core technologies that make robotic exploration possible that you can do as precursor missions as we did for Apollo and as reconnaissance missions could involve things like a robust, um, uh, very efficient propulsion systems uh, that, you know, basically any time you reduce resource consumption, you reduce cost. So one of the things NASA, one of our inheritance is from NASA is really that we do more for less. So any, te any technologies we develop allow us to do a lot more for a lot less, which is very mm -hmm. critical. Another one is, a uh, critical one actually, is autonomy, moving from automated systems to autonomous systems. And if we want to take a a advantage of what NASA actually already started in the way of miniaturization so that mm -hmm. we can essentially build small distributed spacecraft that can act as multifunctional workstations in space, and to take full advantage of that model, which from a scientific standpoint, uh, to learn about uh, systems, basically, to be able to do multiple observations from a perspective, from different perspectives in space and time, you need autonomous systems. If you don't have autonomous systems, you have huge problems with the need for control using a lot of bandwidth. So you want systems that can essentially figure out how to get from point A to point B without you having to tell them whether it's on a surface or in space. So critical is one of the things that the group I, group I now work with uh, at Goddard and elsewhere is working on is a new paradigm in artificial intelligence, which is based on creating a synthetic uh, neural system, which uh, can balance the rules and choices to be able to optimize your performance. So for example, if you're looking at uh, a robotic rover, we have a reconfigurable, addressable design that can change its, its shape, change its gait, 
and after teaching it several core gates, it could choose which gates to use that would most efficiently allow it to deal with the landscape as it changes. Um, another another a key piece um, that's specifically actually mentioned in um, an announcement of opportunity uh, for proposals to do small set tech demos in the Edison program is um, innovative communications. And that also, I think, that in order to truly have uh, communication between spacecraft without having to have uh, ground control involved requires a lot of spacecraft autonomy. Um, the other key piece for operating all the places we'd like to go in the solar system are systems that can survive more robustly in a much broader range of environments, especially in very cold ones. So one of the things that I now work with a, a group to do is pull together the key technologies that allow cold temperature um, operations and cold temperature science that's very interesting based on what we've just learned about the moon over the last decade. Um, there's a lot more interesting processes going on on surfaces like the moon, which is most of the real estate in the solar system, involving volatiles, which has implications for you know understanding the origin of surfaces, processes that are going on, safety for human crews, potentially finding resources we could use as we move across the solar system. So there are there are Technologies that are already under development, and then there are those that are longer term. Um, there, are, there are ultra low temperature, ultra low power electronics now, for example, that are just waiting for an opportunity to populate an entire spacecraft, uh, to do all the basic functions, to, to populate all the boards that do all the control uh, data handling. Um, and there's been a great boon over the last 10 years because of the CubeSat, because, because of CubeSat. CubeSat is essentially a standardized kit-like um, uh, bus, spacecraft bus, that's available and has been used extensively by university students in engineering to practice building systems and flying them in space. And they generally look for an opportunity to be waitlisted on a manifest for something that's going into space. Over the last five years, it's moved from being an interesting demo for university students to being something where they're interested, uh, there are multi-institutional uh, collaborations that want to fly many of these that will take similar or different kinds of measurements to study climate, for example. That model has been effective because it's lowered the cost of involvement. So you have to look at things that, that get rid of all the barriers to participation, whether they're political or financial. It's very important to help to develop really key technologies. And to when you develop those technologies, it'll open doors to getting more interesting science. Both of those things really have to go hand in hand. They should not be considered separate. And while this is going on, we should also be developing core technologies that will enable human exploration. And the things that aren't included in the, in the, you know, in the, in the autonomous robotic exploration would be things like shielding for, for crews in deep space, which is a critical technology. And there are, you know, there are groups that actually have ideas about how to do this. But a lot of times what, what we've done is give people a little bit of seed money and do a little bit of concept development. And then to go to the next level, they need an order of magnitude more funding. And they don't get it because we don't have programs that will supply them funding. So it's critical to be able to, to do that piece. We sometimes call it the valley of death. And moving something from an advanced concept that can be demonstrated a breadboard, at a breadboard level in the laboratory to something that where you can produce a working field model. And our developing of the, uh, the reconfigurable, addressable tetrahedral rovers that we're developing, the shape-shifting rovers, we faced this problem. You know, we got some seed money, then we required some, you know, probably an order of magnitude more funding to actually use the right materials, design something that uh, could actually operate in the field instead of in the laboratory. And, you know, we couldn't do that. So NASA has provided a lot of these low-level opportunities, but then that things aren't really, there hasn't been enough conscious distribution of money across the board. DOD does let that a little better. They actually have, they do a little bit more systematic look at selecting things that they've given some seed money to, to move them up to the working field model level, do a little bit more systematically than, than NASA does. Of course, their budgets are typically a lot larger. But, you know, DOD is facing the same problem that NASA is. Um, they are pulling back systematically to develop things that they can get out the door in a shorter time frame. Mm -hmm. They moved basically to having the most interest in things that can be kicked out the door in six months. If you're kicking out something in six months, it means you already have to have the existing technology, you basically have to have something essentially done, just modify it 
for another purpose. They're already at a fairly high, what's called technological readiness level. Um, and we just have the experience of actually getting some funding from DARPA to develop an intelligent decision engine based design tool that could ultimately also be used for control operations in space. And we were, you know, on schedule, achieved all our milestones, by far, you know, probably the most adaptable and stable tool. And after six months, they lost interest and decided to terminate the project. We were, you know, one, six months away from a prototype that could start to, be, that we could train and essentially become smart. Um, but this kind of thing is not unique to any one government agency. It's pretty much because in Washington, their time scale of interest has just continually shrunk to shorter and shorter, which I think is really, it creates a really serious problem for our future because without any strategic thinking, I think that we are in serious jeopardy of uh, rapidly achieving third world status in a lot of ways. And I really think aerospace is absolutely crucial for any one of a number of reasons. Um, I think that it's a it's high profile. Um, it, um, it really pushes the state of the art in a lot of areas. It, it means facing a lot of challenges that we don't have to face on the earth. And if we look at um, the uh, Apollo period as any indication, we have to solve these problems. I mean, spin off an enormous number of technologies that are directly usable here on the earth to improve the quality of life for a lot of people. So that's, it isn't, I mean, I may find, I find exploration intrinsically interesting. It helps me to connect the dots. I like to integrate things. I need to know about the universe. But I think from a very practical standpoint that the uh, strategic technological viewpoint is, is at least equally as important. And I think it's true across the board, not just for NASA. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, because you're talking about this technological standpoint in development, I think it's important, given the period that we're in right now, which Kennedy, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, understood. He, uh, he did everything in his power. This is why Kennedy was attacked, uh, per se, because and Kennedy was assassinated. Um, because he was adamantly opposed to the drive of uh, the nuclear war. And right now, we're in a situation where the existence of mankind is now facing a fatal point. Uh, we are headed toward the brink of no return. And we're talking about the survival of the human species. What, what is the, the need for understanding the, that this is not the direction we take. Yeah, I think that, that when we, you know, when we keep our vision small and think only in terms of an immediate need, we tend to think um, operationally and tactically only, and we think of a threat, and the way to deal with a threat, uh, as far as, what, you know, just exemplify that what Washington has operated over the last couple of decades is essentially to, to, to go in the direction of hostilities with your existing technology, actually obsolete technology. Everything on the battlefield is already obsolete, mm -hmm. so it's not helping you to maintain a strategic, a strategic lead in technology. But um, you know that the the Kennedy um, had a bigger vision, I think, and he understood um, the importance of uh, longer-term thinking. In fact, so to the extent that it became clear to him, despite what he was told when he got into office, that our involvement in, in Vietnam was very ill-advised and uh, had an executive order to start de-escalating de uh, troop uh, involvement in, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, he also felt that our financial system uh, was, was not, you know, was basically in jeopardy and he, three weeks before he was assassinated, and signed an executive order to limit the power of the Federal Reserve. Um, in addition to that, he started two programs which I think are, you know, just indicative of, of the, the, the kind of visionary thinking he had, that the Peace Corps, mm -hmm. which instead of declaring war on people who are different from you, who don't happen to like, actually involve going and getting to know these people. And you know, I've talked to people in the Peace Corps, and uh, the, 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 they basically say that they learned more than they ever taught, because that's what happens when you go someplace else in the world. Yeah. Suddenly all the things you think you know, you really understand that you really didn't know. So this is the best way to, this is the, the best way to diffuse fear, and it's the best way to build bonds with people and, and create a possibility of cooperation with people. Now, I have this crazy notion, that it's totally insane, and I admit that it's insane, that rather than um, 
rather than um, declaring war on people in Afghanistan or some of the worst people on earth um, who are so good at getting are good at getting blood from a stone because they are so poor and they've lived off the land for a long time with very minimal resources. They also have uh, Afghanistan has a tremendous number of strategic uh, minerals, as you probably know. It, it has uh, abundances of strategic minerals that rival China as a primary source for a lot of the materials we now use in all kinds of technological devices. And in uh, and, and northern Afghanistan. Um, it's one of the most isolated places on Earth and probably one of the closest environments to a Martian analog. So in my crazy brain, I'm thinking, well, gosh, you know, rather than declare war on the Afghanis, what about giving an opportunity to the people in Afghanistan to participate in a, creating a training facility, encouraging education, giving men and women opportunities to be uh, scientists and engineers and technicians. And, and we could probably spend a lot less money and get a lot more bang for our buck. And meanwhile, we've been building all kinds of coalitions to to be to would allow us to share some strategic materials. Um, and we'd be in an environment that's a really ideal place because it has su such little access. It's incredibly dry. It looks like the Antarctic dry valleys, actually. <laughs> that's the place where they normally do the Martian animals. And I just have these crazy notions sometimes, you know. Um, I just think that would actually be a lot more sane than a current approach to not like somebody, have not do some, something that we, we don't care for, and therefore declare war on them. Sure, um, sure beats uh, holding their farmer's hostages to grow opium. <laughs> well, when you don't have an alter, when you're so poor and, you're, and your land is decimated, uh, you don't have, you know, just like in our own inner cities, by the way, um, selling stuff on the black market, drugs, because, you know, we, we basically um, declared street drugs illegal, um, that it, it, it's the obvious way to make money. I mean, and and it's, that they've grown opium in that part of the world for a long time. Opium's used for a lot of things besides street drugs, of course. Um, and and it, you know, it is no different, I think, in terms of our approach to Afghanistan than uh, the British Empire's approach to China during the Opium Wars. It's exactly the same thing. It's all about this. It's all about money to be made at every level by very, by very corrupt regimes. It's been true in many places in the world, not just the Middle East, it's been true in South America. Um, you know, this, this is an indication of a high degree of corruption, otherwise it wouldn't continue. If you don't like people grow, growing opium, then you have to provide people with real alternatives. Instead of declaring them the enemy, you have to make attempts to well, this, when I was in the north of Ireland, I spent a lot of time in the north, north of Ireland. I lived in Ireland for a while. And because I have a, a grandmother who was born in Belfast, and I have a, a relatives from my mother's side of the family who were born in, in County Cork, I felt the need to, and, and my parents' my parents' families didn't get along real well, and my parents had a very conflictual marriage, and I kind of decided I really needed to understand what was going on. The background. So we actually spent a lot of time in the north of Ireland, and I got to, you know, I, I became aware right away that the official model for, you know, the, the way the media report um, what's going on in the north of Ireland, which is a place where we, unlike in other places in the world, we actually speak the same language. They wouldn't think there'd be a language barrier. Nevertheless, the kind of the way that what was going on over there was represented was completely inaccurate. These people were not, they were not. Um, religious bigots. It was not about religion. I, I was in communities with 70 or 80 percent employment. Where the social fabric was completely intact. These people could articulate um, a process of dealing with their pain and their loss and investing it in taking care of each other and reaching out to other people who were suffering in great empathy as an alternative to bitterness. They could articulate this and actually practice it. I figured that this probably is true in a lot of parts of the world. In addition to, you know, like, they didn't deny their history in any way. They were very aware of it. But they also, because they did know their history and they were very familiar with the process they needed to do to, to use that, what had happened to them, as a resource rather than something negative, they also were thinking a lot about their children and about 25 years down the road. They were thinking about a future. I don't think you can think about a future unless you actually understand your past at all. And they could do that very well. So, um, you know, that model People who really have lived under great duress for a long time, who have lived in a war zone for a long time, actually learn what really matters. And that what really matters is the glue that holds us together. It's really the relationships we have with each other. So rather than find people who, who have different sets of values a threat, 
my approach is I find it fascinating. I'm interested in knowing people who don't think exactly like I do. I'd like to expand my horizons, my awareness, mm -hmm. uh, my repertoire of uh, understanding very different skill sets for operating in different environments. And of course, I've always loved geography and I always wanted to explore outer space. So not, they're not really disconnected from each other in, in many respects. Exploring inner space and exploring outer space are really not that different from each other. Um, but I, I think that the one of the things that having strategic thinking does is, is it helps you to think longer term about what the impact of engaging in in uh, a, a uh, in hostilities on a short term basis is going to be for your future, which we're apparently not doing at all now. You know, it's like we're in a completely reactive mode. If you if you think if you, if you could think further down the road, you could think of your children's future. You might actually have a very different vision. If you have that vision. You can figure out a way to get to that vision. It's probably not going to involve a lot of hostilities. You know, it's all true, is it? I don't remember who said it. That nations that have uh, economic partnerships with each other, have a symbiotic relationship, do not go to war. I would think that would be you know, the best thing that we could do is to, is to build these partnerships. Well, let me ask you this: How do you see a difference between the strategic thinking and the outlook? under what you saw with your interaction with Von Braun and the space mm -hmm. industry at that time right. and what it is today? Yeah, that's a good, good question because I think there's some, several key things. Um, one of them is that uh, there, there was much more willingness to embrace risk. I, I think Americans are unique in the world in actually being so risk averse. I think most people understand that there are actually things worth suffering for and worth dying for. And I think that people then understood that anything worthwhile is going to need some hardship and difficulty. And just because something doesn't go, actually failure is the best teacher. And just because something doesn't go exactly the way you plan, it means you really didn't quite get it. You understand your, your vision of how things are is improved, and you'll try something, modify your approach, and try something a little different. And so I think that's actually the single biggest thing that's actually quite different. One of the things I like about it, the CubeSat model as a, as a, a way to create an on-ramp to space, for, at least for the robotic component, is that you have to embrace risk because that's the way you lower cost. If, you, if you're not willing to embrace that risk, then the cost will continue to go through the roof. And this is true for DOD as well. So the quality assurance part, of, you know, checking every component to the nth degree, has just gone off the charts. And actually, that's never the place where you have problems. You have problems at all the interfaces. And oftentimes, those aren't really tested thoroughly because you're building a system maybe with components that have a lot of heritage, but you're building the system for the first time. So um, I think it's, it's, it would be good to make friends with risk. I think it's actually a good thing and it's healthy. And I think that's probably one of the most striking differences. Um, other things. Well, one of the things that they, since they actually had a 10-year plan and they stuck to it, they made a commitment to it, um, they actually had approached going to the moon very systematically. A lot of people think that Saturn V just going to happen. That wasn't it at all. They had a lot of a lot of things, a lot of technologies that had to be proven, developed before we ever got to the moon. For example, um, no one had ever gone out of Earth orbit. No one had actually been in Earth orbit. No one had done rendezvous in Earth orbit. No one had ever left Earth orbit. No one had ever gone orbit around another planet or done uh, deep space navigation and tracking deep space communication, um, hadn't had a lander, hadn't had an orbiter, hadn't had imaging from space. I mean, all these things had to be proven, uh, and aside from also life support in space, of course, for the astronauts. But all these things were systematically done over a 10-year period. And if they hadn't been done, we wouldn't have been able to have the success we did with Apollo. But it's ironic that there were a lot of things about Apollo that were first, despite all the, the ground foundation being, being created for various steps along the way. We also had to understand enough about the lunar environment so that we could design something that would land on the surface. Um, but they also took some chances with unproven technologies. They really didn't know what it would be like um, to try to, for, for the astronauts to be on the lunar surface. They, they, they didn't know, you know, are these tools that they're bringing going to be good for collecting samples? Um, the the, the uh, flight computers they used, they had a lot of problems with despite testing. But, you know, they had backup systems. If you have a human space, you have to have at least one backup system. And uh, they got through it. 
you know, they, they didn't allow they didn't allow failure to stop them. And I think that's that's critical for our future in this country too. You know, we can't allow failure to stop us. And that's why I think when, when people tend to, you know, pull back and and say we should invest less and we should just do these little tiny things, we should all be happy working at Walmart, you know. And I think it should be the opposite. I think in fact when the paradigms have failed, you probably want to think more about strategic planning and you want to think further out and you want to create investments that create a future for people. And I think that's the time to actually push the envelope instead of, over, instead of the way we're operating now. And I th I've seen the vision in Washington grow smaller and smaller over the decades until it's almost non-existent. <laughs> what does it take to rekindle that? Well, I'm heartened by what I see right now. I think there actually is, um, amazingly enough, uh, as Washington has failed to provide any leadership, there's actually a lot of push out here in the trenches to provide an alternative. Um, there are a lot of private companies that, that want to take a chance. It's, it's very risky to uh, see if we can create a, a basic transportation infrastructure beyond Earth orbit. You know, what's happened is after the tax, American taxpayer's investment of, of decades, you know, uh, Earth orbital space is pretty, pretty accessible to people. And uh, we're almost, you know, we're at a place where we could achieve sustainability in Earth orbital space relatively easily, but it's taking that next step to create a infra an infrastructure to go beyond Earth orbit, to be able to go into deep space, and around the moon anyway, if not on the lunar surface. Um, uh, that, you know, I, I, um, you know, I know people are fed up with Washington, but I think a lot of Americans are confused because most Americans think that people in power are generally nice. I have an advantage. I don't think people in power are necessarily nice. <laughs> it's been my observation that a lot of people in power are very corrupt. And because I vividly remember when I was very young, the assassination of probably the three most progressive people we've had in a long time in this country in a very short period of time. I don't have great trust for people in power. And also, the, the, what, it wasn't just the assassination, it was also the systematic cover-up of what really happened. I, I, I don't, and because I'm a New Englander, you know, New Englanders are basically contrary, so, you know, you don't really believe in trusting people in power, and I believe in keeping them, you know, making sure that basically keeping track of everything they do and uh, make, holding them accountable for everything. I think a lot of Americans would like to delegate a lot of things and not hold people accountable. Um, and that has to change. And I'm not sure, you know, there are things that I'm not quite sure how to change. I know there are very, a lot of very unhappy people. I think that probably it would take something like 10 or 20% of the population in this country to uh, basically uh, agree on a very different paradigm to turn things around. Because I think, you know, there's a fairly large percentage that feel so overwhelmed that probably and, if, and, and to be fair, I mean, it, it, for a lot of people it's very hard because life is a struggle. And people are worried about employment, supporting their families, and maybe working through jobs at places like, uh, you know, like Donald's and Walmart. And I think that it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard for people to focus on anything else but immediate survival. But I'll tell you what I learned in Ireland, which is that if, if all, you know, joining forces with your neighbors is really critical. If you try to do, go it alone, and you think only of your own immediate survival and not of the people that are closest to you, um, I think that you really get sucked down to a dark hole very quickly. So what I saw in Ireland was that in those neighborhoods with 70 or 80 percent unemployment, people made sure that there was nobody that went hungry and that people needed to get to the doctor and got to the doctor. And that people were, taking, were watching the kids and that uh, the elderly were being taken care of. And neighbors just connected with each other to make sure that happened. Um, people just, I mean, you know, people, adults in the community just consider that to be a normal responsibility. There was no big deal about it. They just did it. You know, they, they were, in my, the way I look at things, they were heroic, just unsung heroes. You know, they just got up every day and did what needed to be done and took care of things that needed to be taken care of. Therefore, the social fabric was intact. I think it, it takes real effort to do that. I think we had that in this country, but people took it for granted. I didn't think that it was anything special. It turns out that being able to keep that glue together is critical for raising a healthy community and raising children that have proper boundaries, you know, that have a sense of responsibility about each other. How do we recreate that? 
I don't know. I'm trying to get my book published on this, based on the, the oral history interviews I've been in Ireland. Not that one book can change the world or anything like that, but you know, I think that um, we have to we have to talk about that. I'm part of a couple of different working groups where people are trying to create a different paradigm. And you know, I just do it. I don't try to second guess myself as to how effective it is or how many people I'm reaching today. I just feel like there really isn't any alternative to creating a different, doing everything in your power to create a different paradigm. I'm not willing to to accept uh, things as they are, just not because I, I mean, real politic in the sense of what people in Washington are, the way, what people in Washington are telling me the way things are. You know, I just refuse to accept that. And people sometimes call me naive because you know I believe in having a vision and making it happen as, as much as humanly possible. And I'm also a person of great faith. I believe that what I'm doing is something that uh, I'm doing to serve my Creator. You know, it's just to me my being willing to stick my neck out and say things and try to create things that are different, that, um, that are challenging to the status quo, is part of what makes me a person of faith, living my faith. And that's one of the reasons I do it. I think it gives glory to God. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that's so wonderful about the space program. That's why we are here. You know? We've got to explore creation. And, and every time we find it, well, look at Mer look, we just found out about Mercury from the last, you know, the messenger mission. We suddenly say, wow, whoever knew, you know, and we thought we knew, but we really didn't know. All these things going on, we still can't explain it. You know, but it, it, as a scientist, I love, I love the questions, I have to admit. I, I know people find that frustrating. But I find uh, a lot of unanswered questions to be, uh, you know, really driving for uh, curiosity. You know, without that, you know, what is it? If we had all the answers to things, I think it would be pretty boring, but fortunately we don't, and we never will. Yeah, yeah. And as we learn more, we understand that we know less. Just kind of keeps us humble. Too. And we have to inspire the next generation. 